The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe in trusting Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Though His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome everyone to Pastor Yeshua. As you know, we are currently going through the book of 2 Thessalonians, and in our last episode, we had just entered into chapter 2 of that book. So if you will, please open your copy of God's Word, and we'll continue where we left off. Now, as you will recall, in chapter 2, in verse 1, Paul had just started a new topic wherein he is talking to the Thessalonian saints and by extension to us today saying now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. In other words Paul is taking up the topic of the rapture. Further, because of some misinformation which we assume to be circulating in the Thessalonian church at this time when Paul is writing the letter, he admonishes the Thessalonians in verse 2 to not be soon shaken in mind, to be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter from us as the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, as we pointed out, through some misinformation which was circulating, the Thessalonian church was beginning to doubt and to believe that the day of Christ was at hand, i.e. that they had missed the rapture and that they were currently in the tribulation as a result of the persecution and the troubles which were going on uh, in that time. In verse 3, which we took up at length, Paul again admonishes the Thessalonians and us, saying, Don't let anybody deceive us by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a catching away, or the rapture, and then the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition. This then brings us to verse 4, where we currently continue forward, where Paul says, 
regarding this man of sin, who opposest and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. So here in verse 4, Paul begins to give us some details regarding what this man of sin is going to look like. Verse 4 combined with quote-unquote the lawless one in verse 3 above seem very strongly to suggest one of two things. A. The lawless one is either a complete atheist without any regard for any god or any biblical law. His only law would be those laws which he makes or sees right in his own eyes. Further, he should rule and his law is enforced in a dictatorial, godlike manner. He will legislate and speak from the temple, either being built in whole or in part, in order to demonstrate his power as God. Or B, the lawless one is a one-world religious figure combining multiple religions and denominations and dictating a unified hybrid religion where he is God and or the Messiah. This leader uses secular and social theories to reinterpret the Bible as useful to his agenda, which is his power and control. And again, he will sit in the temple either in whole or in part and use it to portray the idea and belief that he is God, i.e. Messiah. So here in verse 4, the Antichrist meets the criteria of the one who is the height of deception and revolt in human history. The only problem is that if we take verse 3 literally and we define apostasia, that is apostasy, as deception and revolt, then, quote-unquote, that day, the gathering together of the saints, or the rapture, will not happen until there is first the deception and revolt of the church, and from the truth and the Antichrist is revealed. This would clearly be in line with either a mid-tribulation, pre-wrath, or post-tribulation position. If true, the problem is that Paul's admonition and encouragement to the Thessalonians would make little or no sense. The Thessalonians thought that the tribulation was already upon them. If a mid-tribulation, pre-wrath, or post-tribulation position is true, then it would make more sense to tell the Thessalonians that what they and the church were experiencing was only the beginning and that the great tribulation would make the present seem tame by comparison. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So, here again, we are told that Paul gave the basic foundational faith and teaching regarding the existence and timing of the rapture and Christ's return to the Thessalonians and or the church in general when he founded the church in Acts. Verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. The word withholdeth in Greek is katecheo, which means what hinders or restrains. Here, what is hindering and or restraining goes back to verse 3 and the word apostasia or apostasy. Verse 3 clearly says that the apostasy, whatever it is, must come first before the lawless one is revealed. Here, verse 6 is saying that the apostasy, whatever it is, is restraining or hindering the man of sin from being revealed. The context provides another opportunity to test the theories posed in verse 3. That is, that either the apostasy is a departure by the church from the basic 
tenets, doctrines, and theology of the Bible, or the apostasy is the departure, which is the rapture, the removal of the church from the earth. Here again lies the problem. If apostasy is rendered as mere heresy or departure from the truth, then we would have had many opportunities through history for heresy and or the lack of truth to provide the opportunity for the man of sin to be revealed. In fact, I would be surprised that he hasn't appeared by now because we, in fact, had so much heresy and departure from the truth. But if apostasy, as we've been making the case, means a rapture or removal from the church, well, there haven't been any of those, but when there is, there will be only one, which also supports the use of the definite article in verse 3, quote-unquote, the, which we already talked about earlier. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now here again in verse 7, we have a verse which is uh, theologically loaded with various theories as to who it is that is doing the letting. But we'll get to that in a minute. First of all, we have the word iniquity, which in the Greek is anomia. It's a compound Greek word with the uh, Greek letter a, which means the opposite of or not. And then the word nomia or nomos, which is God's law. So in other words, when you say anomia, you're meaning saying anti or against or opposed to God's law. Then we have the word letteth, kacheo. Again, as in verse 3, it means withholdeth, or what hinders, or what restrains. Lastly, we have the uh, word, quote-unquote, he, who is the one doing the restraining, in verse 7, is the same as the, quote-unquote, what, which withholds. The proof is that the same Greek word is used in both verses to describe whatever or whoever is doing the restraining. Let's paraphrase the verse this way. Quote, For the mystery of lawlessness, that is anti-law, is already at work. Once and only when the one who is restraining comes out of the midst, unquote. So the question is, in both verse 6 and in 7, who or what is, quote, the restrainer, unquote. Historically speaking, eight possibilities have been given regarding the answer. The historical possible answers are as follows. One, the Roman government. Two, the gospel being preached. Three, the binding of Satan. Four, the providence of God. Five, the Jewish state. Six, the church. Seven, the Holy Spirit. And finally, eight, Michael the archangel. So let's look at these possibilities briefly to just see which, if any of them, holds any merit. Number one, the Roman government. Well, while the Roman government was in control at the time Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, it is difficult to see how a secular government who had no love for the Christian church and went so far as to imprison and kill Christians, could then be construed to be an impediment to the Antichrist. A further since the Roman government fell in 476 AD, 1500 years have now passed, and the Antichrist has still not arrived. 
Thus, the theory seems to have disqualified itself. The only other way that this theory would be valid is that if one believes in preterism, that is the theory that Christ has already returned, which seems very unlikely given the state of affairs of the world today. 2. The Gospel Being Preached Okay, well, if the lawless one, i.e. Antichrist, cannot be revealed until the preaching the gospel is removed and no longer continuing from the earth, then the chronology of Revelation presents a fatal problem for this theory. First, Revelation chapter 6 verse 7 says clearly, quote, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Unquote. Second, Revelation chapter 13 makes it clear that the quote-unquote lawless one, i.e. Antichrist, is on the scene on earth, causing everyone to have his mark, so that they can neither buy nor sell. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6, which is chronologically after these two events, makes it clear that the gospel is still still being preached on earth. Quote, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Unquote. Thus, it is clear that the quote-unquote lawless one, i.e. the Antichrist, is revealed and the preaching of the gospel is still on earth, making this theory false. 3. The Binding of Satan Well, the binding of Satan does not occur until Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, using the same chronologic order of the gospel preaching detailed in number 2 above. We can also say that since the quote-unquote lawless one, i.e. Antichrist, has already been revealed seven chapters before Satan is bound in chapter 20, that this theory disqualifies itself and is also false. Number four, the providence of God or and or God's sovereignty, both are synonymous terms since Absolutely nothing happens outside God's providence sovereignty. It would likewise go without saying that the quote-unquote lawless one, i.e. the Antichrist, cannot be revealed unless and until it is according to God's timing, providence, and sovereignty. The problem is that the original Greek is translated, quote, to be taken out of the way, unquote. In the context, whatever is being, quote unquote, taken out of the way is acting as an obstacle. While it is true that nothing can happen until God's sovereignty is no longer preventing it, it is equally true that nothing has or is happening without God's sovereignty. In either case, God's sovereignty is always present, and on this basis, the grammatical use of the Greek phrase meaning, quote, to be taken out of the way, unquote, seems inappropriate. On this basis, I would disqualify the providence of God and or God's sovereignty as being that which restrains is false. Number five, the Jewish state. If that which restrains is the Jewish state, then verse 6 makes it clear that whatever it is that is restraining the lawless one or the Antichrist is restraining him at the time that Paul was writing. There's little argument that Rome was the controlling power at the time Paul was writing. While Rome allowed some Jewish governance, it was always in submission to the greater authority of Rome at that time. 
the existence of a Jewish state could not be argued to be a reality until 1948. But this theory is not arguing for the establishment of a Jewish state, but rather the removal of a Jewish state. Thus, even if 1948 marks the establishment of this Jewish state, we would still be looking for an event which essentially reverses 1948 in order to fulfill this theory with the Jewish state being taken out of the way and thus no longer restraining. Further, if there was a Jewish state in Paul's day, it was clearly vested in the interests of Orthodox Judaism, which was more often than not hostile to Christianity. So a removal would be more to the advantage of Christianity, and persecution would decrease, not increase. On this basis, I would disqualify the Jewish state as being that which restrains in this verse. Number six, the church. The quote-unquote church, according to a biblical definition, is two or more persons who have been quote-unquote called out or drawn by God from the world and who have repented of their old nature and who rest by the power of God's indwelling Holy Spirit upon the finished work of Christ and his identity as Messiah and the Son of God. The existence, vitality, and health of the church, both individually and corporately, depends on the existence, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the two must always be discussed together. The church can be removed from the earth while the Holy Spirit remains on earth. But, if the Holy Spirit were to be removed from the earth, the church, if it remained, would cease to be the church without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. If the church is to be salt and light, as in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and if the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, as in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19, then the efficacy of the church in these matters is ultimately by and through the agency of the Holy Spirit according to God's sovereign will. Thus, the removal of the church via the rapture would automatically offer the vacuum needed for evil to prevail in its full measure. This would certainly qualify as being the Antichrist or the lawless one. Number seven, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is frequently theorized to be the agent which is removed here in this verse from earth in order that the lawless one may be revealed. However, this theory requires the following considerations. It would be necessary to also remove the church before or simultaneously because neither individual believers nor the church can function without the presence of the Holy Spirit working in and through its individual members. If the Holy Spirit is removed from earth in the sense that it is no longer functioning in any of its given capacities, then from that point forward, repentance, salvation, and sanctification would no longer be possible for anyone on earth, since the Holy Spirit is essential to each of these. Since the Holy Spirit is part of the triune Godhead, we would have to seriously ask theologically whether it is possible for the Holy Spirit, which is co-equal, co-eternal, co-omnipresent, to be limited to only being in heaven and not on earth. In the end, it would not be necessary to remove the Holy Spirit. It would be theoretically sufficient that the Holy Spirit cease or selectively do its job with or without the church. 
For all the reasons stated thus far, I would submit that the Holy Spirit is not the one who is being removed from the earth in order to facilitate the Antichrist or the lawless one coming on the scene. Finally, we have number eight, Michael the Archangel. Here, a lesser known theory is that Michael the Archangel is the quote-unquote he who will be removed or taken out of the way so that the lawless one, i.e. Antichrist, can be revealed. This theory is almost exclusively held by Messianic Jews because Michael is the captain of the heavenly host who battles for and protects Israel. Secondly, those who identify Michael as the quote-unquote he are also mid-tribulational, or more accurately, pre-wrath proponents. This theory presents several problems. A. We would have to commit the error of replacement theology and transfer Michael's responsibility from Israel to the church, or simply extend Michael's role to everyone who is a child of God, be it Jew or Gentile. B. If Michael is responsible for helping and fighting for Israel, then what becomes of Israel during the tribulation who is clearly portrayed as enduring the tribulation in Revelation? C. In Daniel chapter 12, Michael is specifically named as quote unquote standing up for Israel who is very clearly pictured on earth during quote, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, unquote. This presents a contradiction because Michael cannot be, quote, taken out of the way, unquote, and at the same time be said to be, quote, standing up on earth for his people. D. We hear only two mentions of Michael in the New Testament, the first of which, in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, refers to Michael disputing with Satan over the body of Moses and being limited to rebuking Satan in the name of the Lord due to lack of authority. The second is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, where Michael fights with Satan and prevails at a time Satan is cast out to the earth. In the end, the insertion of Michael as the quote-unquote he who is removed has very little merit since it comes out of left field where there is absolutely no mention, no suggestion, no allusion to Michael anywhere in the context of the entire book of First and or Second Thessalonians, not to mention the absence of his mention in any of Paul's letters. Having looked at briefly and considered each of these eight possible answers as being the, quote, he, unquote, who is restraining Antichrist or the lawless one, I would have to say that based on the totality of everything in God's word in context with the arguments having been made, that the candidate which makes the most sense is the church. The church is the he who is restraining in verse 7, and as such, we could therefore paraphrase verse 7 as follows, quote, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only the church, the outcalled ones, who now restrain, will restrain, until the church, the outcalled ones, are taken out of the way and or raptured, unquote. Verse 8, And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So again, here Paul is telling us that the lawless one, the Antichrist, or the uh, wicked one, is revealed after the church is raptured, and then subsequently, when the Lord 
makes his second coming that the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Again, the second coming. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This verse identifies and verifies that the man of lawlessness is one and the same as the Antichrist, alternately known as the beast. The phrase after the working or with authority, the original inflection instead of after which creates the impression that the Antichrist is merely copying or imitating or similar to suggests that Satan actually confers some or all of his power and authority to the Antichrist. Perhaps what is being discussed is Satan possessing the man of lawlessness, making him the full embodiment of the Antichrist. This is why the Antichrist is able to perform signs and lying wonders. Further, the signs and wonders are not quote-unquote lying or illegitimate on their own. They are lying in the sense that the signs and wonders are used to prove ostensibly that the Antichrist is the Messiah in his second coming when in fact he is not and he and they are quote-unquote lying about this fact. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 10 here continues regarding the lying wonders and signs whose purpose and intention is to deceive. However, the lying wonders, the deception, and signs can only be effective in the end for those who God has not called according to his sovereign will and purpose to the election of salvation. It is only those who perish because they have not received the truth about who the Messiah was and is and who have an abiding relationship with him. Simply as a point of logic, those who have a relationship with the true Messiah, Jesus the Christ, will have already at this point been removed from the earth via the rapture. Thus, the only people left are the 144,000 who are sealed from deception to solid faith in Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then there's the world of the unregenerate, who, like so many in Jesus' time, were looking for a conquering Messiah rather than a suffering Messiah. Now, the same group will think that the Antichrist is the conquering Messiah of Scripture, when in fact... He is an imposter. This concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I would encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Yeah.